Hello, welcome back to the second unit of our course, Research on Corporate Transparency. So it's theory time. And I thought that um, I'm going to start with a maybe a little presumptuous uh, sounding title, Why Theory? So uh, when, you, when you are an empiricist, um, then sometimes maybe you are holding a belief that maybe theory is hard to digest and a little bit detached from the data problems that you try to solve in the real world. And, and this short video is all about trying to convince you that this is wrong, <laughs> and that you should actually really care for theory and also work uh, to understand the master theory a little bit. Okay, let, let's dive us uh, let's dive right in. And I don't want to lecture you on this, but I want to give it an example. And this example actually was motivated by our Q&A session that we had last week. Um, so there we had a debate about uh, an interesting question. So the interesting question was related to social media and the role for social me of social media for corporate transparency, uh, widely defined. While we will be having a whole unit uh, talking on disclosure channels, which of course will also touch upon um, uh, social media as one disclosure channel, I thought this is interesting maybe as an example of why I believe theory is actually super important for, for doing good research. Okay, so let's take this question. Uh, it clearly is an interesting question. It's also a little bit fuzzy, right? So we don't know exactly what good or bad means. We are not entirely sure what this entails. It's, it's of course judgmental. We don't have a yardstick. So, so when you start to think about this question more precisely, then instantly you will try to get more structure on this. So let's assume that we had this discussion about the structure of the question and whether the question could be made more precise. And then let's say uh, you come up with a new question. Okay, so uh, this question is more precise. It's one out of many questions that you that you can tackle based on this motivating topic of, 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 let's say, social media and corporate transparency. And here the question would be, does social media disclosure cause mispricing on stock markets? Okay, so this is a relatively clear cause and effect question. So a positivist question that you can try to answer. Um, so, and, and it also has a bunch of terms that are relatively clear. So mispricing is something that we can use the finance literature to understand what mispricing is. Stock markets, we are aware the stock markets is and social media. Well, you get the idea, right? And now, of course, you could think about social media disclosure as something new and unique that you have to think about and you would be precisely right. Now, let's assume that you have this question in mind and you want to do research on this. You're all excited and you talk to your favorite theory person. Okay, everybody should have a favorite theory person. So you talk to this favorite theory person about this. And maybe just maybe I'm not a theory person, but I like theory. So maybe this theory person would come up with some, you know, uh, some some questions or ideas. Yeah. So a very simple question to ask would be what I label the KFI question. Well, KFI knows why, but I'm not going to disclose where KFI is or who KFI is. So um, KFI likes to ask a very simple question. What do you believe is going on? This is a great question. So what do you believe is going on in our setting here means, well, why do you believe social media disclosures could actually cause mispricing. So why do you believe that is? Can you explain that argument for to me? Yeah. So now you would start explaining this argument. And here is a typical argument that I know from, you know, discussion with fellow researchers, PhD students, master students. So and I'm asked if I'm asking them these kind of questions, then they come up with an argument and I label this an ad hoc argument. Nothing wrong with an ad hoc argument, but it, it, it just indicates that this is not really a thorough argument, but it gets us somewhere, right? So, yeah, so the empiricist is now thinking about, well, why actually should this cause mispricing? And they say, well, maybe maybe people are misled by influential people, like influences, right, on social media. And now all these misled people, they will start to hurt um, trading to the same direction and then potentially leading to mispricing, right? So this looks, sounds like a very reasonable argument, right? So, so we know that influences are exist. Uh, that influences exist. We know that maybe, uh, you know, these influences have influence on us, right? So otherwise they wouldn't be called that way. So I think it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with this line of thought, but it's still somewhat imprecise, right? So now maybe the theory person says, well, this is an interesting thought. Let's try to understand this a little bit deeper. And it will come with a bunch of questions to you. And these are typical questions that from a theoretical perspective, you should, um, uh, you know, consider. Okay. So first question here, you know, what about the influencer? So why is the influencer actually misleading people 
You know, is it that the influencer is just randomly off or is it that the influencer has an incentive to mislead people? You know, is there something going on with this influencer? So why is the influencer misleading people? So what is this, right? So then the next thing, hmm, so uh, in order to be misled, you, you have to be, you know, you have to be open to misleading. So what, what happens to the uh, followers of this influencer, right? Are these fo followers considered to be rational? Are they making rational decisions or do they have some sort of behavioral bias that you have in mind? Yeah, so, and then, and then strongly related to this, what makes them believe the influencer? So why do they, Assuming that they, they don't have perfect information, why do they choose to follow the influencer? Why do they trust? So how, how, how does the influencer manage to actually send a signal that the, that the, um, re followers will actually follow, right? So what, what makes them believe? Okay. So, and then assuming that this is going on. So there is an influencer and she misleads people deliberately or not. And the people actually follow. So there is another player here in the game and that's the firm. So, the firm now observes yeah, maybe that the influencer is starting to mislead people. So why is not the firm acting on this? So if, if the influencer is misleading people and this, and this is eventually causing stock price um, uh, changes, so mispricing, so wouldn't the firm have an incentive maybe to issue offsetting disclosures? So, and then again, Okay, it's fine that there is an influencer that on social media maybe influences some people, but what about the other market participants on capital markets, right? It's not only Redditors on capital markets. There are also other market participants. So why don't they arbitrage? So if there is an obvious influencer causing mispricing in the uh, equity market, why isn't the others, like the institutional investors, the heavy money, right? Why is this not um, offsetting this? Hmm? Why? Right? Okay. And then typical theory trip. Well, herding. You talk about herding. So there are, there's a theoretical literature on herding and, and there are various explanations for herding on capital markets and they differ in terms of the mechanisms that they impose. Maybe you should read a little bit this theory literature and think about whether you can build your argument on one of these theory strains because this would help you to build your argument. You see, you know, this is the typical sort of debate that you are having when you when you talk to a theory person about you know a potential research idea and i like this very much to me these sorts of questions are really helpful for me to 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 structure my argument and i'm not claiming that this is a full set of questions but just the questions that you know i came up with when i was thinking about this topic a little bit okay so now again of course you can start to answer and this is Again, a typical ad hoc type of answering these questions, right? So, so maybe you, you think about this and say, nah, maybe the influencer has some private uh, stake in the stock, right? That could be a reason that a clear incentive. So she wants to beef up prices because she holds a long, holds a long position, or maybe she's short in this particular stock. And this is why she wants to dump the stock. So yeah, so this could be an incentive. So maybe the followers are just a little bit over trusting. So they don't, they don't really, um, you know, they don't really um, um, second um, guess the, the statements by the influencer. Or maybe they're also a little bit overconfident in their stock picking ability. So that the, that the followers have said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm good in picking stocks. And, and maybe they are not really rational here. Okay, so we have a behavioral argument why the followers follow. And then maybe, maybe the firm is just unable to, discuss, uh, to, to adjust disclosure routines on short notice. Yeah, that could be the case, right? And maybe, maybe arbitrage costs are too high for institutional investors until mispricing is really, really extreme. Right? Now, all these are potential answers yeah, to this argument. But now, this is something that I, you know, I really like about, uh, you know, thinking about this in a little bit deeper. Now it's time to meet Occam's razor. So Occam's razor, um, is a, is a very simple thought. Um, it's not, it's not a clear guided rule. It's more a principle that you, that can structure your way of thinking about arguments. Occam's razor in principle says, uh, whenever you can make an argument more, uh, parsimonious, simpler by, by, uh, omitting or by, by reducing it to have fewer assumptions, then normally this is a good thing. Yeah. So try to make the point as simple and as bare bones as possible without hardwiring too many assumptions to it. Yeah. And here in this particular case, so the type of argument that we are building is, 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 
is really depending on a, on a series of assumptions. Yeah. So a long series of assumptions. So now the problem with these assumptions is, um, whenever you, whenever you test something, you're implicitly testing two things. One is the math of the argument. Yes. Yeah? So whether the argument, the, the, the math of the argument is actually correct. Let's hope that it is. And B, um, uh, the assumptions. Okay. So now when you have too many assumptions, so a, a wide range of assumptions, then this basically means that whenever you 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 um, have a test and the test fails the theory, so you, you you are able to reject the theory, then you don't know why. Yeah. So because there are so many assumptions, so if you find that that stock pricing maybe is not um, uh, um, actually causing mispricing, then now based on your assumptions, there is there is a large range of reasons why that might be the case. So this means that if you have these assumption heavy theories that are extremely, you know, complex and 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 and, and you know, um, uh, laden with with uh, um, detail, then um, it's not really pointful of actually testing them, yeah. Because whatever you see, you know, it will most likely it will be impossible to link to a certain aspect, and then the whole theory is is not descriptive. But well, this is not supporting uh, surprising, given that it's based on so many assumptions. But we don't learn anything new about, you know, what what is the the actual reason why the theory failed. Okay, so it's really important to think about very simple cause and effect relationships for good empirical designs. So. Now, um, the, because of this, the, the theory person will say, can you come up with a, maybe a more, a more focused and, and a more parsimonious argument why uh, you actually predict the association to be there? So what is the most important thing that you want to test? What is the core mechanism that you believe is important and that you want to study? Yeah, so if you come up with this, with this central mechanism, then maybe it's easier to test it in the lab or maybe in the field, right? So, and, and that means that by, by doing such a paper and doing such a test, you can actually contribute to the advancement of knowledge better. Because this is where other people can build on. Because then they say, okay, this person tested this one assumption and, and this one mechanism, then one theoretical mechanism, and, and provided some input that either enforces this mechanism or refutes the mechanism. But, you know, at least we can build on this because we know what has been tested. Whereas if you have these convoluted arguments and then you provide some tests, we don't really know what is going on here. Okay. So this is, um, what I really like about this whole de debate. So that if you think about theory, then it helps you to, to really focus your research on issues that you can actually test. And this is something that, oh uh, yeah, I like it, right? I, th I think I said it three times now. Good. Okay. Apologies for that. So let's me, let me wrap up this first video real quick. So, yeah. So why theory? Well, research needs theory. Yeah. So, um, I think there is no way that, that you can really say that you can make a, a clear empirical contribution that other people can build on besides the absolute narrow setting that you did the study on when you don't have a clear theoretical link in your, in your paper. Right. So whenever you are interested that, that readers can generalize your findings to some broader question, then I think you need to be very explicit in, in what you're actually testing and what the underlying mechanism that you strive to test actually is. And for this, you need theory. And in this regard here for our little case study, I'd say, okay, now, um, now we have an interesting idea, but in order to develop this into a potential research project or PhD paper or whatnot, um, I think it would be good to, you know, take a step back and maybe think a little bit more about uh, the theory in that field. And here in this regard, I'd, I'd had three um, direct suggestions. So one would be uh, try to understand a little bit the herding literature. So there's an interesting literature on herding in financial markets. Um, uh, there's rational herding, there's behavioral herding. And, and, you know, this is something that, of, of course, um, somebody interested in that field um, should actually dive into a little bit. Then um, the association between liquidity and asset pricing is also um, uh, very relevant. So this is something that we briefly will also touch upon in the fifth or fourth, fourth unit, I think. Um, and then, uh, of course, voluntary disclosure. So why do, what, what is the incentive of the influencer to disclose? What might be the incentive of a firm to disclose? Yeah. So you have three different theory fields actually that are intertwined in this topic. And I think it, it would be worthwhile, 
um, you know, spending a little bit of reading on each of these fields. So this is why theory, this is why I believe theory is very important uh, to economic work regardless of you're an empiricist in the field, in the lab, theory guy, or somebody else. Okay, thanks. This is the first video. Now this should serve as a motivation to dig into the dip into the uh, following videos that are, oh, great surprise, about theory. Okay, cheers, bye.